Thanks to Rothy's for supporting Muller, she wrote. Have you heard about this company making stylish shoes out of recycled plastic water bottles? Oh, and they're insanely comfortable and machine washable. Get yourself a pair today with free shipping at rothys.com and use promo code AG. And thanks to Beta Brand for supporting Muller, she wrote. Who says comfy can't be work appropriate? Beta Brand wants you to look good and feel good, even at the office. Go to betabrand.com slash AG, all lowercase, and get 20% off your dress pant yoga pants today. And thanks to SoFi for supporting Muller, she wrote. SoFi is the leading student loan refinancer in the United States. They've refinanced hundreds of thousands of student loans, and it's fast and easy and all online. Check your rate in two minutes at SoFi.com slash AG. This is Seth Abramson. I'm the author of Proof of Collusion, and you're listening to Muller, she wrote. So to be clear, Mr. Trump has no financial relationships with any Russian oligarchs. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, the, our position is. I'm not aware of uh, any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I didn't have not have communications with the Russians. What do I have to get involved with Putin for? I have nothing to do with Putin. I've never spoken to him. I don't know anything about him other than he will respect me. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. So, it is political. You're a communist. No, Mr. Green. Communism is just a red herring. Like all members of the oldest profession, I'm a capitalist. Hello, and welcome to Muller, She Wrote. Uh, this week, we're on the road with Richard Painter in Minneapolis. I'm your host, A.G., and I'm by myself in my hotel room, but I have to tell you, Richard Painter is one of the funniest, most amazing guests we've ever had. It was so great, I felt that we needed to share this show with you. Also, we've confirmed that we will be live in Seattle at the Triple Door Dinner Theater on September 13th. Presale starts this Wednesday, June 19th, for patrons only, and we'll email you the code. This show does include a VIP meet and greet. And don't forget our San Francisco VIP tickets sold out in two hours. So you'll want to take advantage of the presale if you're a patron. If you're not a patron, you can become one for as little as three bucks at patreon.com slash wrote. Tickets go on sale to the public Friday, June 21st. But for now, please enjoy this recording of our live show at the Parkway Theater in Minneapolis with Richard Painter and a theater packed with the best podcast fans in the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, the Parkway and Theater in Minneapolis is proud to present Muller She Wrote Live. And now, please welcome the host of Muller She Wrote, A.G. I love it here so much. Um, first of all, Prince, thank you. And the right Prince, not Eric Prince, right? F that guy. Um, I've heard some great things uh, coming out. First of all, tonight, you guys, I'm really excited. We have Richard Painter with us. From the University of Minnesota who I hear is now allowing beer and wine sales in their hockey and basketball games. Is that... <laughs> Fuck yeah. Just wanna be courtside with a Chardonnay, like trying to not let that happen. Check me. Uh, and uh, I know that this is where Amy Klobuchar is from. And she just came out today for impeachment, so. And she did it in her own little Amy way, too. She's like, well, yeah, no, yeah, I think that would be good. <laughs> Love her. I, I watched her announcement in the snow. Oh, that was so great. Uh, but I am, I'm really excited to be here. I'm from the Midwest, so I love my Midwestern family. I'm from Akron. I grew up in a little house. Like, you don't clap for Akron. 
It's like 10 houses around a little pond that was just barely enough, uh, big enough for hockey and uh, used to pick blackberries in the summer. And we had a lot of good years here. I moved away when I was eight, couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and went out to California and, uh, and that's where we are now. And I gotta tell you, my hair's really flat <laughs> out here. I don't know if that's a, th is it humidity? Is it? Mosquitoes, I don't know what's happening. Uh, but we're starting to get mosquitoes now in San Diego, and I thought we had clemency because of our high rents, but no, apparently not. <laughs> apparently it's becoming more tropical because the jet stream is moving up because there's, you know, not climate change or anything. Just, no, no, just random hoaxy stuff. It's just, they're bussing mosquitoes in from the border to our sanctuary city. Because <laughs> that's what they do. Yeah, did you hear that? Uh, migrants are starting to show up in sanctuary cities in, in busloads now. Just here you go. Uh, and, and the sanctuary cities are great. They're like, yeah, come on in. Have, sit down. Have some water. We, we won't put you in a cage. Welcome to our town. Uh, and... <laughs> And I just see Trump like, God damn it, they're nice to them. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> asshole, what an asshole. <laughs> it does suck. I fucking hate that guy so much. Uh, but, but he, uh, you know, and I'll be honest though, if there's a silver lining, it's that we have this community now. And... <laughs> and what it represents and what we have found out that we can actually do together when we raise our voices, you know, put our shoes on, go out and march, do all the stuff. So thank you because I know you guys thank us a lot. Thank you for the podcast, but seriously, thank you for listening to it because it's just as therapeutic for us <laughs> to just talk about this shit, to be able to joke about it and to be able to talk about it on this kind of visceral level that's sort of, you know, we, I know we make fun of a lot of stuff and it's, and, and I, I love you guys for understanding that we're not dismissing it as not important, you know? But we need to find humor in it and at least so that we can just hang on and like clench arms together and stand shoulder to shoulder and fucking deal with it until it's over, which is soon. <laughs> so hello and welcome to Muller She Wrote. I'm your host, AG, and with me as always are Jaleesa Johnson and Jordan Coburn. <laughs> Hello. Wow. I can't tell if it's working. <laughs> you guys. They're just so. Look at what you have created. <laughs> so Thank how, you. how's your day? Huh? It's good. You know? I've been full. Yeah. Nothing no, you don't incredible, know. Incredible, guys. Thank you so much. It's Seriously. weird to have you guys here without. The podcat, like running around. Oh yeah, we need to bring... up the place. Yeah, yeah. You know? Podcat is gone from the room now, though, and we can breathe again. Yeah, was... yeah. <laughs> He's back, He's free, back. living with his brother. Uh, his cancer yeah. is gone, so thank you if you. <laughs> Donated to my podcast, and yeah. he's, he's doing good. But we don't have to watch him pee in front of us anymore. So. No, dude, yeah. can you all hear that ever? The pee, right? you can hear it, right? <laughs> Only for patrons, right? That's a different level. <laughs> Very intimate, yeah, yeah. And he's looking at us like, yeah, yeah. It's like I'm getting some airtime out of this as well. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, you are like solving fascism and cat cancer at the same time. So thank you for everyone that donated to the GoFundMe that we had for Abubica because, yeah, that was very helpful. And uh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. And it's cool being here because we were talking about like all the cool things about Minneapolis. And so Prince is from here. And I remember Jordan was saying that's so cool because you thought he was from space. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, Minneapolis or space, one of the two. Yeah, he yeah. identifies as an alien. Exactly. Yes, yeah. Yes. Minneapolis is like anti-space, sort of. Oh, not okay. in a bad way. Safe space. Not in a bad way. Yeah, it's a yeah. very safe, calm, chill spot. You yeah, know? yeah. That's yeah. salt of the earth. <laughs> salt of the earth. Yeah. Is that a reference to something? 
I miss all of her references. I like how it's any, happening. Is that a Prince reference? I no. can't tell you. I'm just playing it cool right now. Oh, I have no idea. Is it? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> is it like like Salt Bay? Is that like salt, a... salt of the Earth, down to Earth, Salt of the Earth? <laughs> yeah, forget it. We'll tell you. It it's an 80s like movie thing. you haven't seen yet. Okay. Oh, it sense. is. It is a reference. No. Fuck. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> That's fair. I would have fell for that too, Jordan. <laughs> Just a saying then. No one from California is salt of the earth, so we wouldn't have heard it. Okay. Well, they get it, so that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you about it later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's dirty. No. <laughs> Make everything dirty. I'm just going to fuck with them now. Like, dude, you guys salt to the earth? You know what salt to the earth is? You could tell me it was anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, like a I'd sexual like, position. Oh, I believe you. Yeah, yeah. Start using it incorrectly that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. That's end of bit. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Clearly written. That very, was very all organic. Yeah, so you called it a bit yeah. like we rehearsed it. Oh no, no bits can be or you know improv bits. Yeah, yeah. That's most of our jokes. Yes, yeah. and salt. I'd like here. to equate my ignorance to bits if it means I can get away with it. That That's fair. That's fair. I like that. Yeah. Enough jokes strung together, you get a bit. Enough bits strung together, you get a chunk. Enough chunks, then you're just wasting your life. Yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, that's not true. I love comedy. Maybe we should have wrote something. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we're like, it'll be fine. We'll just get yeah, up here and just talk. <laughs> it'll be great. All right, and it is. Do your great. cat bit. Get your cat box bit. No, I'm kidding. I'm oh just, yeah. Uh, no, we'll no. do like a hot five minute set right now. Yeah, yeah. That's salt of the earth is what it is. Jordan yeah. has a great bit where she she's a cat. She inter, like acts like she's a cat, but it's you know I'm I'm just ruining it. Now. It's an old truth or dare. You just Google it. Google it. YouTube it. It's You'll on find YouTube. It. It's I shit in a litter box because someone dared me to when I was eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> and her mom walked in. That's that's what the bit was. Huh? And her mom's like, what are you doing? And you're like, meow. Yeah. <laughs> I love a good cat bit. Yeah. All right. I was pod cat in, <laughs> in a past life. It's all come full yeah. circle. Well, I am really excited for this. And, and, and here's what's cool. You guys know that we have the two Sarahs, right? They, they do our advertising, our marketing. They do all sorts of stuff for us. Social media management. And, and we can't begin to express how, first of all, wonderful it is that you guys are here. But we have put together a great show for you. We've turned just the facts into a quiz show uh, for the panel. Uh, we've got Sabotage. Uh, we're going to play the Fantasy Indictment League uh, this week. We have the interview and some fun surprises. But now, joining us on our panel tonight, one of the Sarahs, our very own social media and marketing director. You know her as... One of the Sarahs. <laughs> Everyone, please welcome Sarah Lee Steiner. I like that song. She asked to be brought up to Toto's Africa. <laughs> That's my jam. Yeah, not Weezers for some reason. Right? No. <laughs> Unacceptable. I couldn't say no. So and make sure that uh, you talk right into those mics. You guys are all comedians. You know how that goes. So oh, I don't yeah. have to teach you. But it's so glad to have you here, Sarah Lee. We haven't had you on the panel yeah. yet. No, this was a complete surprise, and it was fun. <laughs> Sarah Lee and I had a great time last night. We did a podcast called Awful Neutral, yes. uh, where we played D&D &D for like two hours. And um, <laughs> that was... It was D&D, &D. and um, <laughs> no, but it was so much fun. It was really fun, and you're so funny. Your character, Gertrude, can, can you give a little Gertrude? Uh, my name's Gertrude. I'm down to four packs a day. <laughs> I'm an elf who identifies as a fairy, but I'm aware that I'm not passing. <laughs> It's a modern version of D&D. &D. Yeah. My parents are really proud. <laughs> so. 
My character is a seven foot tall Goliath, think Brienne of Tarth, and in my head, everyone wants to have sex with me all the time, but nobody really does. So I'm constantly <laughs> saying, don't look at me like that. Relatable. My weapons are a rape whistle. <laughs> If I blow it, it's like a plus four, two D four attack damage. Yep. Something. Everyone gets fucked up, oh. and uh, it's really interesting. Uh, interesting uh, show. So, uh, anyway, guys, I'm really excited to do this, and I want to kick off our show with my favorite new segment, corrections. It's a mistake. It's hard for me to say I'm sorry. Uh, apologize. Shut the fuck up. I like how we put both of them in there now. So it's got the, I apologize, and the price is right bit. We've, <laughs> we've melded them, and that pleases me. All right, so, uh, Julissa, one of our listeners wants to make sure you knew that all cows are female. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think now my, like, five-year-old brain remembers the bulls are males, right? Yeah, you got okay. it, you got it. Okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> In fact, you are correct. Are... Cattle is the term for bovine beasts. Mm. Cows are lady cattle that oh. have had one calf. Until they've had a calf, they're called heifers. <laughs> and most males are castrated very young and are called steer. And the ones that make it past one year old with their junk intact are called bulls. Well, good for what? them. Yeah, what, what's a cow that has a heartbeat called? A heartbeat cow? <laughs> what? Okay, too soon. I didn't I don't have know. a punchline for that. That was just a. <laughs> that was an honest question. <laughs> I guess it was rhetorical. Wow, I didn't know. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to split the crowd so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ew. I think they weren't booing, booing you as much as they were booing heartbeat bills, because everyone here knows that there's no yeah. fucking okay, heartbeat right, cool. in a fetus. Okay. Like, is there a faction of PETA that's very liberal and, and anti heartbeat bill for humans? But for cows, they're like, save the heartbeat cows. We gotta, we gotta do that. Okay. Totally. This is where <laughs> PETA's headquartered. <laughs> um, from our last main episode, the leader of a marching band is called the Drum Major. Oh, and yeah. I was right about the parade guy being called the Field Marshal. That's correct. So Milo Yanaplopa fucker is. <laughs> The gay Nazi field marshal of the straight pride parade, which sounds... It sounds like some short fiction I would have written in college, but it's... That really happened. Um, Is that his new Twitter bio? Have you checked yet? That sounds like a solid Twitter bio. I know, right? Yeah, it, we need to check it. Um, uh, speaking of Czech, the Czech Republic... Uh, I'd see that segue? It was good. Smooth. Yeah, that was yeah. good. They have officially changed the English pronunciation of the name of the country to Chechia. No. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, people who live in the South wanted to make sure we know they also enjoy avocados. Yeah. I don't take back what I said. Yeah, yeah. they're also close to the border. That makes a lot of sense. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the ocean border. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, they live close to you know, right. Mexico, Texas. Right, I assume Texas. we all knew which border. Yeah. But Tex-Mex... <laughs> Okay. I, yeah, barbecue, though. Pretty good. All right, and now, this one's big, guys. During part four of our special coverage of the Mueller Report, I don't know if you're listening to those. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we noticed that Mueller mentioned an architect, but not by name. And based on the fact Mueller was reporting on the nameless architect in conjunction with Cohen and ritz Kaladze, I assumed it was John Fodiatis. And uh, we had said that since he wasn't mentioned by name in the report, either he was worthless or a target. <laughs> well, today I got a text message from John Fodiatis. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm worthless. <laughs> First of all, he's the architect for a lot of Trump's Eurasian real estate deals, and last year, uh, Christine Wilkie from CNBC said she reached out to him, and he took down his website uh, immediately and sort of just ghosted. He gave the old spaceman goodbye. <laughs> Uh, she was saying, uh, she had sources saying Mueller was questioning him. Well, he sent me a message today. Oh. Oh. Get your feelers out. It's intense. <laughs> Let me get your number. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a DM on Twitter, so Mueller has it. Um, <laughs> I should respond like Mueller's reading it. Like, yeah. 
Like, don't mess with Mueller, he's a sexy motherfucker. So he says, hello there, it's John Fodiatis. Yes, that John, John Fodiatis. <laughs> I came across your rather entertaining podcast as I occasionally do a search for my name on Twitter to see what, if anything, people are saying about me these days. No, it gets better, it gets better, it gets better. I, I, we all Google ourselves. I search my name. Man, we do. I don't, but it, I mean, Google. Not very Google. many things come up. <laughs> he says, and it's going to sound mean for a minute, but it gets real nice at the end. He says, before making statements about me in the future, I'd kindly and respectfully ask you to at least take a look at jfa.nyc my old and live website. You'll see an announcement from last year about my work at a new firm, as well as a link to my old project portfolio. You can also find me at LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn.com slash in slash in John Fodiatis. Uh, Isn't that for people who have jobs? Oh. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> like, Damn, Damn, Jordan. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> He, go, he continues, the timing of CNBC contacting me in April and the start of my new job at the same time was unfortunate to say the least. I had pulled down my website and company Twitter account simply because I had just completed a negotiation with my new employers to start and was asked by them to do so, so as not to confuse their clients and create a perceived conflict of interest. I had decided to wind down my old firm in late 2017, months before, we need like background music, no, we don't. <laughs> months before, uh, I was contacted by CNBC. The fact that the journalist who wrote those two articles uh, implied in her tweets at the time that she somehow smoked me out and took credit for me shutting down my firm is quite an overreach. And I think it says a lot more about her journalistic ethics than it does about me. <laughs> Nevertheless, given what happened, I immediately put my webpage back up. <laughs> so to us be clear, I was not disappearing or spaceman goodbying. <laughs> and had been rather cynically suggested. Okay, but, but the Twitter horse was already out of the barn, so to speak. Uh, in any case, that's really beside the point. It's long. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, very, very rambly. <laughs> what really happened to me is that I simply chose not to respond to her, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And for the record, no one from any investigation has ever contacted me. If you've heard otherwise, your sources are wrong. Uh, I suppose that puts me in the worthless category. <laughs> That made me so sad to read. <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck. We totally just, yeah. I tried worthless. to explain to him that worthless is good. It is. Because, <laughs> yeah, the other option is a target. Yeah. It, yeah. Means, it means he didn't name you in his report. Mm -hmm. Finally, I'd like to point out, since winding down my own practice, I've uh, been able to work and pursue my other passions with newly found extra time, uh, uh, et cetera. Comedy. He does comedy. He uh, has an album that's coming out. Uh, he or no, he it came out January. His tape. It's available everywhere. You can stream it for free. <laughs> Did he just drop a Spotify on leak? SoundCloud? Or SoundCloud? We're promoting him right now by reading this. I feel so dirty. Wait, Sound he SoundCloud.com slash Empty City Squares. He just did what every high schooler does when they decide they're going to become he like He dropped an his mixtape in oh my, my DMs. Oh, my God. <laughs> then he says, if you go to the top of my SoundCloud page, you'll see I'm no stranger to podcasts. <laughs> he, he wrote music and occasionally appears on Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. <laughs> and then I opened my eyes. <laughs> Such a low bar. Uh, if I were to try to respond to every single piece of media, et cetera, et cetera, but you're awesome. And no, he didn't say that. But uh, he, he f searched, he found, he listened, he texted. Thanks for taking the time to hear me out. Best of luck. Let me know if you are in ever need of any music. All the best. John Fodiatis. As a point of clarification, architects typically do not design bridges. <laughs> That's my bad. Yeah, I made that stupid <laughs> joke that he could buy a bridge and then you said he could burn it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they may chime in on aesthetics, but the heavy lifting and design work is always done by structural and civil engineers. So, we got a correction from John Fodiata. <laughs> so I chatted for a bit. He's a very nice fella. And his website is back up and he was never named in the Mueller report. I don't yeah. know who the architect is that they were talking about, but... That is unfortunate, though, that the second CNBC reached out to him to inquire about his connections with Trump and all of his buildings, he took down his website. That is kind of shitty. That is like, oh, man. That but he said not. it just so happened that he was getting a new job and they asked him right. to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah so he's exactly. like, mm, shitty timing. Did exactly. he just think about that story, like, after all this time? <laughs> he just thought of a good cover-up? What do you think? I, I don't know. I feel like he, I feel like he's, 
being real. I, I get so Goldstone too. vibes though. Like I'm still Gold on the fence about. Stone. Yeah, they both like present themselves very reasonably, but it's like the timing is so suspicious. Goldstone was really yeah. nice. Uh, he, yeah, they're both nice. Yeah. I think assholes can be nice. <laughs> yeah. He set up that Trump Tower meeting, and and yeah. here we are. And for some reason, Trump Jr. was too stupid to prosecute. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, guys, those are corrections. Thank you very much. Rothy's shoes are stylish, sustainable, and comfortable enough for everyday wear anywhere. Once you try shoes that are comfortable, stylish, and sustainable, you're never going to wear anything else. Head to rothys.com and get free shipping with no minimums with code AG. I have to tell you about my new favorite shoes, and I'm kind of obsessed. Rothy's checks all the boxes for me. They look good, they feel good, they're sustainable, and they are literally the most comfortable shoes that I own. Rothy's comes in a wide range of colors and patterns. They're available in four styles, the flat, the point, the loafer, and the sneaker. And they transition beautifully from work to happy hour. And I can wear them with yoga pants or skirts or dresses or jeans or even my suit. And uh, they launch new colors every week, and they sell out all the time because they're so popular. Uh, I have one of each of the four styles in black because I just wear black all the time. But I wear them everywhere. They pack well, they're breathable, they're machine washable, and they go with everything. The best part uh, for me is that Rothy's are made from recycled plastic water bottles. And to date, they've diverted over 25 million water bottles from landfills and oceans. They're manufactured in a zero waste factory and they ship directly in the box so there's no packaging waste. You'll quickly realize why BuzzFeed calls them their forever shoes. So hosting this podcast means a lot of travel. We're in Minneapolis right now. There's a lot of walking, a lot of marching, a lot of standing. And Rothy's are so breathable that my feet don't sweat. They're machine washable. They keep my feet happy so I can focus on my work. Plus, I feel good about everything Rothy's does to minimize waste and recycle. I love these shoes. I know you will, too. They are the most comfortable shoes I own. So they have an amazing deal right now for our listeners. Use code AG to get free shipping on your Rothy's with no minimum. That's free shipping and free returns and exchanges on your Rothy's shoes. But trust me, you won't want to return them. So go to rothys.com. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com and enter AG to get your new favorite flats with free shipping. You'll be glad you did. Guys, now it's time to get to just the facts. <laughs> All right, we're going to turn this news uh, week into a quiz for our panelists, okay? Along with open discussions about the facts between us. Uh, I used to do a thing where if somebody on the panel got a question wrong, I'd make them wear a MAGA hat. Um, <laughs> like a dunce cap. That was back in the day. That's when we first started. It was July of 2018, I think, when we did our first show. But now it's like, it's akin to asking someone to put on a KKK hood. I can't fucking do it anymore. Yeah. So fuck that. We don't want Which is in my it. Amazon cart, but I was like, no, we probably should. <laughs> 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 Kidding. Where do you buy that? You got to make it. You got to make it. Etsy. <laughs> I'm done. I'm... <laughs> oh, fuck. That's fine. <laughs> All right, Julissa, you're first. <laughs> Julissa, this week the Justice Department has agreed to provide Congress with key pieces of underlying evidence collected by Mueller that could shed light on obstruction of justice and abuse of power to include interview notes. Which committee in the House will these documents be given to? The House and Ways Committee? Nope. Well, that, fair <laughs> effort. <laughs> hey, could I get a second try? Or are you going to let me do I'll give you a hint. Jerry Nadler's in charge of it. Oh, uh, the Intelligence <laughs> Committee? Judicial. Yes, the Judiciary Committee. That's why I'm not in Congress, I will say. I wouldn't know which meeting to show up to. Yeah, not House Ways and Means, not <laughs> Intelligence. It's Nadler, right. As we know, Nadler has subpoenaed a bunch of underlying evidence from the Mueller report, along with the full report without redactions. Barr and the Justice Department defied the subpoena and didn't hand anything over, so Nadler was going to take his committee contempt vote, which they already voted to hold him in contempt in the committee. They were going to take that to the full House on Tuesday. But then... The Department of Justice agreed to start producing some of what Nadler was looking for. Anyway, they, they wanted to start producing some of what Nadler was looking for, provided uh, Nadler didn't take contempt steps. They're like, if you don't, hey, I'm Bill Barr. If you promise not to hold me in contempt in the full house, I'll give you some stuff. It's a pretty good impression, yeah. <laughs> And uh, in response, Nadler stayed the contempt vote on Barr in the full house and accepted the deal, adding that if they slow-rolled him or failed to hand over any of the information, they'd move for contempt. 
But instead of holding the contempt vote, what Nather did was pass a, resolu a resolution to allow committees in the House to skip the full House contempt vote and go directly to court when subpoenas are ignored. That's so smart. That's it's, a smart it's, thing to do. It's good because you know uh, we all want him to open impeachment inquiry to you know as a to have that judicial official judicial process open or procedure Whoa. open. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, <laughs> but this is kind of the way that they're trying to do it because Pelosi's still like no. Yeah. Um, Clutching her orange well, pearls or something. Yeah. Yeah. And and yes. <laughs> Well, the resolution passed, okay? <laughs> and so this means that if a House committee, any of them, subpoena documents or testimony and the Department of Justice or the White House ignores them or defies them, they no longer have to take the vote to the full House. They can file suit immediately. And this is important because when Nadler subpoenas the Department of Justice for the grand jury material and they refuse, he can petition the court directly. And that, that's what the Jaworski report was during the Nixon era, if you remember. That was the grand jury material where they found indictments. We already have it in the Mueller report, but we think they want more, whatever. Yeah, and I feel like anything that you can move out of Congress is, and into the courts is good. Because then it takes any sort of political, you know, red hair. Like, people can say, oh, it's just a political move holding them in contempt of Congress because Congress has become such a tainted polarized place, but if you'd send it directly to the courts, then I feel like that legitimizes it, and you can just bypass that conversation. <laughs> sort of, because Trump will go, it was an Obama of judge. Of course. There's an Obama judge. You of hate course. that guy's Mexican, he can't judge. <laughs> yes, but to not have to go through a, a pretty unprecedented process of holding someone in contempt of Congress is For smart. Sure. And we yeah. know what's going to happen, too. I mean, you know, so you go directly to court, then the court compels him to do it, then he appeals, and then it goes to Supreme Court, and then in a lot of these cases, the Supreme Court has no choice but to uphold the ruling. But then what if Trump just decides to ignore the Supreme Court? Like when the Supreme, Nixon Supreme Court, you know, compelled the handing over of the tapes, and they did it. It took them a couple weeks. They were trying to get that Stennis work around, which was dumb. But they eventually had to do it. But I feel like Trump would be like, no, I'm not gonna. And then what? Then what? That? Well, <laughs> we should already be doing that. But like, do we just uh, eat him? Do we just? <laughs> just he's arrive? not rich though. No, he, it's he's not all eating the rich. <laughs> rich with nutrients. Eat the indebted doesn't have the same ring <laughs> yeah. as eat the rich. So meanwhile, in the oversight committee, they scheduled a vote to hold Barr and Wilbur Ross in contempt for defiance of a subpoena for materials regarding the citizenship question. But the night before the vote, the Justice Department wrote a letter, hey guys, <laughs> uh, and said, if you, if you guys hold me in contempt, I'm going to have Trump invoke executive privilege on, your, on you, and then, and then where you'll be, huh? Uh, and, and they would have to, you know, they would have to think about stopping document production uh, in other matters. But Elijah Cummings wrote back saying, eat shit, asshole. <laughs> and... The Oversight Committee voted 24 to 15 to hold Bill Barr and Wilbur Ross in contempt. They made that vote. And since Nadler in the House passed the resolution circumventing the House vote on these matters, Elijah Cummings can take this straight to court. So, And we know the citizenship question is big since we recently found out that Thomas Hoffheller, Hoffheller, the grand wizard of gerrymandering, um, that's what we're calling him, played a significant role in orchestrating the addition of the citizenship question to the 2020 census to create an advantage for Republicans and whites. His words, not mine. So, fuck that guy. All right, Jordan. Speaking of the House Judiciary Committee, they held their first hearing this week on the lessons of the Mueller report and crimes of obstruction of justice. Aside from Nixon's White House counsel, John Dean, can you name the two female former U.S. attorneys that testified who have both appeared on Mueller, she wrote? That would be Barb McQuaid and Joyce Vance. Yeah! Yeah. Smart ladies. Yes, badass. Yes. Yeah, I came out today. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, and we'll talk about Kellyanne Conway when uh, Richard Painter comes up here. But I immediately got a text from Joyce White Vance, and she's like, need a lawyer? That's awesome. I love that lady. So the hearings went pretty much as we thought they would. The Republicans yelled, FISA, and uh, deep state, dossier, struck page, and um, 
But they had zero questions for the witnesses about the Mueller report, which is what the hearings were for. They even brought their own little Republican fuckface who was like, I don't think you committed a fraction of darkness. <laughs> and then nobody asked that fucker questions for the rest of the time. He just sat there like, nobody's asking me any questions. <laughs> Because the purpose of the hearing was to draw parallels between the corruption seen during Watergate and what's happening now, right? And the Republicans and, uh, had, like I said, that Heritage Foundation douchebag. And he's like, no, Mueller failed. Rosenstein made the call with Barr. I hate that guy. But John Dean made Milkshake Matt Gates a laughing stock. <laughs> Gates is all, mm, how much money do you make on CNN? And I wanted him so bad to be like, how much money did you make from Russia? Oh, yeah, that breaking news uh, with the NRA. Apparently, one of our listeners told us um, that the Washington Post got a hold of their 2018 tax documents, the NRAs. They're $10.8 million in the red right now. Yeah. <laughs> Appropriate Sometimes. reaction, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to think that's only one ninetieth of what Trump lost in the eighties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that math is probably wrong. Don't check it. <laughs> and I love John Dean. He's like, well, Sonny, you weren't even born yet when Watergate was happening. Uh, fuck boy. But you yeah. know, why don't you go get another DUI? So <laughs> And then Wait, he asked him about, he, he's like, uh, Gates is all, well, can you tell us about how the Democrats plan to pay for the ACA? And he's like, what in the fuck are you talking about? And he's like, well, if you're going to talk about stuff you don't know about, it was the worst setup to any joke ever. And he's like, you know, Nixon actually had a health plan, right? And then it, everyone laughed. He's like, I'm not a fact witness, dipshit. I'm here to provide historical context. Eat shit. <laughs> I hate that guy. But Joyce Vance and Barb McQuaid schooled the Republicans. It was great. Uh, they tried to, to discredit John Dean because uh, they're like, well, you know, you committed the obstruction of justice. You were the obstruction of justice guy, like Cohen. And, and I'm looking at him like, yeah, these are your people. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're making fun of Democrats for bringing up Republicans who broke the law. <laughs> Like y'all are, and then, uh. Yeah, like as if it's their preference, they just committed to being criminals for the entirety of time, which is their actual preference, so I think that's why they're actually mad. It's just because <laughs> they switch sides to the good side. Yes. Yeah. I put quotes because, I don't know, I, feel, I also feel like John Dean, some people did some really good articles on how much of an asset maybe he really was to the Democrats in that hearing, because there were some things that he said that maybe were a bit counterproductive to the legitimacy of the Democrats' position. But Yeah, yeah. And I always hesitate to, like, fully revere, you know, someone that in the past... I don't. Has... He was an obstruction of justice criminal. He's done a lot to atone for his sins, but he's a Republican lawbreaker from the 70s. Right. And, and, and that is the parallel he's sitting there making. Right. Like, you guys are doing the fucking same shit I was doing. Yes. Yeah. And then making fun of me for having... To, and then he's like, well, you went to prison. He's like, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just embarrassing for yeah. Matt Gates, And I love when he embarrasses himself. The bummer is that the, the reason why he would be such a powerful witness and testimony is because he had come from Republican roots, but unfortunately, it's never received by the Republicans. So it just <laughs> winds up being... More you or less need self-awareness for that to happen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But and yeah, that no. is missing. Go John Dean. I do appreciate what he does. <laughs> All right, Sarah Lee. The obstruction of justice hearings in the judiciary were not the only hearings to start this week. Two former FBI agents, Stephanie Douglas and Robert Anderson, testified about the counterintelligence investigation that happened in parallel to the Mueller investigation. What House committee did they testify in front of for the counterintelligence? God. Uh. <laughs> intelligence get a lifeline right we can what you want to call in a friend i am calling a friend jordan yes. who was whispering i believe yes. house of intelligence yes <laughs> hey i said that one two questions ago do i get credit for <laughs> she's just ahead of her time yes you were just yes. being <laughs> thank you seeing thank the you. future you and prince from space 
The Hipsy House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. The two former FBI spy hunters testified Wednesday in front of the House Intelligence Committee in an effort to get the contents and understand the ramifications of the Mueller report and to have those things out to the public because we all know 3% of the public have read the Mueller report. Uh, and once you read it, you support impeachment. It's just how it goes. Or listen to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or Thank you, sir. Is, is that the new expression? Once you read it, you impeach it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it should be. Uh, as we know, Nancy Pelosi is saying we must have an ironclad case to move forward. But to me, 10 instances of obstruction of justice, four which clearly meet the three criteria for charging a crime and sustaining it, facing appeal, is pretty fucking ironclad. <laughs> So Adam Schiff opening statement was cool. He said, of all the questions that Mueller helped resolve, he left many critical questions unanswered. What happened to the counterintelligence investigation? We've been asking forever. Uh, Maddow says it's gone walkies. Um, She's very cute. I love her. He says, were there other forms of compromise, like money laundering? Were those left out, uninvestigated, or referred to other offices? Yes, Mr. Schiff. If you have any questions, listen to Mueller, she wrote. <laughs> Were individuals granted security clearance that shouldn't have them? Yes. Listen to Mueller, she wrote. <laughs> and are there individuals still operating in the administration that leave America vulnerable? Yeah. They yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seem like rhetorical fucking questions to me, but I know what he's doing. He's trying to get the public to oh, ask yeah. these questions of themselves because they might not have. So these two former FBI agents warned that Russia has been engaged in election interference since before 2016, and they won't stop. Anderson said the interference worked in 2016 because those around Trump were not savvy in counterintelligence issues at all, <laughs> or life. But basically, just like the Russians targeting Carter Page, because he's a greedy, gullible idiot, the Russians targeted the Trump campaign and Kushner because they're easy marks, right? They're compromised, okay? And, and we all know that. They have ties to shady foreign interests, like Iran's Revolutionary Guard being linked to Trump's projects in Azerbaijan. Hey, Fodiatas. <coughs> and, um, and just as Mueller, he didn't have anything to do. I was gonna say, come do. on out, John. <laughs> and now, no, he actually didn't have anything to do with that. He just tapes I'm, into the crowd. <laughs> Stand up, where are you? No, I, I just feel like I'm just giving him a hard time. That's probably not fair, but yeah, well. And uh, <laughs> he was so nice in text. I really want to say Oh, like yeah. It. He was yeah, very, yeah. It, like Gold. You guys heard the Goldstone interview? <laughs> just a pleasant fella. <laughs> All around. I'm, oh, hey, I'm just me. Hello, Goldstone. <laughs> oh, I like doing, I like promoting, and oh, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Mickey Mouse now. I like that transition. <laughs> that character oh, arc was nice. Yeah, like hey, Breaking Bad. Yeah, hey, yeah. Minnie. Hey, come over here. <laughs> um, and just as Mueller found during his investigation, many of the Trumps are too stupid to be charged with crimes. <laughs> Specifically, Junior, because in order, honestly, in order to violate uh, an FEC foreign campaign contribution violation and those statutes, you have to know at the time that what you're doing is, in, is illegal. And he's just not smart enough to know. Uh, another really interesting point Anderson brought up uh, it was the Russian method of recruiting and compromising targets called tasking. And we've seen this a lot at play in the Trump campaign and so, on several occasions. The example he used was when Kalimnik, Konstantin Kalimnik, tasked Manafort with handing over internal Trump polling data. And what Anderson says is the act of complying with the Russians by handing over the polling data is central here. It's more important than the actual polling data. Uh, and this reminds me of when the Internet Research Agency, who was in charge of recruiting unwitting Americans to campaign for Trump on behalf of Russia, tasked an American with making a sign wishing Putin's chef a happy 55th birthday and holding it up in front of the White House, and the dipshit did it. <laughs> and so that guy, recruit that guy, save him, you know. Or, or when they ask that uh, other American to dress up as Trump in a Santa suit and run up and down the streets, they're just tasking people to see if they're gullible enough to do this shit. And that was the polling data shit with Manafort, right? And Schiff talked about how it's not a crime to enter into a deal for Trump Tower Moscow while running for president, but it's very compromising. 
Uh, and then he, you know, he just kind of went into a speech about it's not a crime to do this, but it's very compromising. And that reminds me of Glenn Simpson <clears throat> from the Fusion GPS testimony when he talked about why he hired Chris Steele in the first place. Simpson noticed Trump would try to start a bunch of deals in Russia, but they never went through. And he found that alarming because that's what Russia does. They, they string you along and dangle these the things in front of you to get what they want, and then they ghost, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then All they bring up another one. Ghosting. Yeah, yeah. And they ghost on that. And uh, the Republicans in the counterintelligence hearing brought their own guy, Andrew McCarthy, former federal prosecutor who writes for the National Review. <laughs> um, <laughs> but even he said that the Trump campaign should, should have contacted the FBI when the Russians reached out. But of course, Trump comes out this week and tells Stephanopoulos in the Oval Office behind the Resolute desk that he would take dirt from foreign enemies without calling the FBI, maybe. Yeah. Just because he has to get to look at it first <laughs> to decide if it's chill or not. That's the new Russia, if you're listening, I hope you have the 30,000 emails. Yeah, that's there. everyone, anyone, if you're listening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and now anyone, if you have anything ever, yeah. And, and now he's expanded his search. <laughs> And so, you know, then we had to walk those comments. He had walked those comments back because you can't, um, but you can't, you can't walk those comments back. It was like Giuliani's Ukraine thing. You can't just, oh, never mind. You, you can't unring the bell. Uh, cheating and gerrymandering is the only way Republicans can win, and they know it. So, and Devin Nunes, of course, called the Mueller report a shoddy political hit piece. Coming from Nunes, that's special. <laughs> Why is he even allowed in that room anymore? <laughs> be like, yeah. Are you Moo mooing or mooing? What's Moo happening? <laughs> it all sounds the same. <laughs> we got some ghosts, a little ooing going on in the back. Yeah. It is, it is. Nixon's ghost. All right, we're going to get through a couple quick news stories here because we got to get on to sabotage here in a minute. But uh, let's see, Donald Trump Jr. returned to testify and said, I just said the same shit, bro. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, three hours he spent ask, probably answering no questions. And then Flynn fired his lawyers and then hired this crazy bitch. And then I thought he was going to blow up his plea deal. Turns out today he's still going to cooperate and uh, help out in the Bijan Keon case, but they asked for 60 more days to decide whether or not he's going to be a total asshole. Yeah. Uh, so that's what's going on with that. And then, of course, Hope Hicks has agreed to appear before the House Judiciary Committee. Yeah. I don't, she's the cutest, I guess, but she's <laughs> she's not going to answer any questions about the transition of her time in the White House. She's only going to talk about shit that happened during the campaign, just like the documents she handed over. It's going to be a lot of, uh, I can't talk about that, executive privilege. <laughs> um, mm, uh, she's more like, mm, uh, executive privilege. Mm. And they can't hold anything against her, like perjury, she didn't do anything like that? Like, mm. oh, yeah. So then, then we'll just get the transcript of her going, mm. How do you I'm type sorry, that? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Resting I bitch face in quotes. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna privilege. All right. We'll see those transcripts and I'll read them in that voice for you. So. Hey, Muller Junkies. We're on the road right now and we're spending a lot of time speaking in front of crowds, meeting our patrons and hanging out with agents and politicians. And while I love wearing my comfy pants, these are more business attire events. But who says work appropriate can't be comfortable? Beta brand not only looks amazing, they're just as comfortable as my yoga pants and they give me energy. My legs, they get energy from the, the compression and the thick fabric. Um, my new favorite pants of all time are the Beta brand dress pant yoga pants. They're super comfortable. They come in uh, different styles like boot cut, straight straight legs, skinny, um, cropped. And while I tend to buy everything in all black, they come in all kinds of colors, including your standards like navy, gray, and khaki, but they also have seasonal and limited edition colors that they release monthly. These pants are made of soft, breathable, four-way stretch knit fabric. They're sturdy and supportive. They're also tagless and wrinkle resistant, so they pack and travel brilliantly. Plus, they have incredible details like real belt loops, pockets, front buttons, and faux zippers. So I used to buy all my suiting from the standard places, and without fail, I'd be sitting in a meeting, uh, and the pants would start pinching me, or they'd be sweaty and uncomfortable. I was in a meeting one time, and the tag was driving me crazy. I couldn't even focus because of it. And I use an exercise ball as my office chair, and the old pants were just really restrictive in their movement. That's why I replaced all my pants with Beta Brand Dress Pant Yoga Pants, and now I'm incredibly comfortable and stretchy all day. I can't say enough amazing things about these pants, so head to betabrand.com slash 
AG, all lowercase, to get 20% off yours. That's betabrand.com slash AG for 20% off the most comfortable pants you'll ever wear. You'll be glad you did. All right, are you guys ready for sabotage? We just listen to it for a second. All right, sweet. Thanks, Beastie Boys. Love you, MCA. All right, so the sabotage this week, the Office of Legal Counsel put out a memo today, a whole giant stupid memo saying that, uh, you know, Steve and uh, the IRS Commissioner Charles Redding, Steve Mnuchin, he hates being called Steve, call him Steve whenever you can. (laughs) Uh, Steve, and yeah, so they're like, nope, uh, we've decided in the Office of Legal Counsel, our opinion, our legal opinion is we don't have to hand over taxes because you don't have a legislative purpose, which they don't need, and because we're stupid, which they are. Um, that's not in it, but it should be. <laughs> so that's the, you know, I, I don't think that's going to have any impact on the Fantasy Indictment League. But are you ready to play the Fantasy Indictment League? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Still waiting for that season to this letter. <laughs> that's when we know we will have made it. They got yes. bigger <laughs> fish to fry. <laughs> when they got NFL is like NFL stop players. That shit. We're just gonna change one little thing, like ice vanilla ice did. Like it's not dun dun dum 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 dum. It's dun 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 and then and then we like what dun 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 dun. It's not the same. Yeah. I hope the NFL just sends Rob Gronkowski just to come tackle us or something. That's their season. <laughs> as long as somebody does the Iggy Shuffle, I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, all right. Oh, we're in. Oh, we're yeah. in Vikings country. I take that back. Okay. All right. So, Jaleesa, you get to go first for this round. Who do you pick this week? Ooh. Um. I will pick. Oh man. Um. I'm trying to think of who's the juiciest one this week. Um. I'm, I mean, I'm always going for Trump Jr. But we'll put Jr. We can do yeah. Junior. Okay. Cool. I'll come around. Sure. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Jordan, who do you have? I'm stuck on Tom Barrick. Barrick's a good one. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's gross. <laughs> okay. Superseding Stone. Oh, yes. Jaleesa. Oh, um, you know what? Let's do Trump Victory. That's a new one. Oh, oh the Trump yeah. Victory Fund. Ooh, Trump V is what I'm going to put. Trump V. <laughs> oh. That's a little neck thing he's got going on, right? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> Wait, Cottage neck thing? In there. Yeah, know. it's like a vagina. He's got a vagina neck. That was a joke. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Everyone's got a vagina neck. <laughs> Everyone's I shouldn't vagina neck shame. That's, that's, really that's the, the sign. You will one if day you have a vagina neck. That's now just I'm what cursed. happens. Yeah, by saying yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's the sign. If you see Trump, just be like, yeah. <laughs> he made fun of too many people with vagina necks, and now he has one. Oh, All right, Jordan. Made fun of people with the oh vagina? no, that, I'm sorry. I was. Oh, just sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm sorry. I was yes ending okay. you. No <laughs> vagina neck shaming. Uh, okay, Jordan. <laughs> uh, Soriano. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I'm gonna go with. Snuck in. Oh, sorry. Yep. No, it's all right. Going okay. with Sullivan. <laughs> oh. I know. Old school Stonehenge. Yeah, right. yeah. Julissa, who do you got? Um. Yeah, I also want to do Trump Org. It's like bingo. I'm gonna try to get them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh. With that same logic, I'm going to do Trump inaugural. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Fine. I'm going to do an AMI. Hmm. All right. Ooh. Oh. So uh, no one got Seder yet, right? Seder? Felix yeah. Seder? Yeah. You don't think he'll be back in the mix anymore? <laughs> you know what? If he gets it and I don't pick it, I'll feel really bad. You'll be so mad. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go Seder. Jordan. Uh, I'm going to... S- Steal your game and do Pecker. Oh. <laughs> You've selected Pecker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then uh, Howard. If we're going to stick on the AMI train, one more pick. Okay, um, I'll do Brittany Kaiser. You always love her. You love her. I do, when yeah, I feel like one day. She's going down one day. It's coming. <laughs> Jordan? Uh, I will do Psy Group, even though they would respond to no correspondences. From Who's, this? Who's this? Psy Group? Psy group. Yeah. Yeah, you can still, you can definitely indict him. I'm going with Imbiza. Mm-hmm. All right, and that is how we play the Fantasy Indictment League. Oh.
All right, everybody, it's time for the interview, and we are so excited and so lucky to be joined by our next guest, law professor at the University of Minnesota, and <laughs> the vice chair, former vice chair of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. We know them as Crew, longtime Republican, recently ran for Senate in this state in 2018, literally wrote the book on government ethics. Y'all, I'm trying to say y'all now instead of ladies and gentlemen, inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, please welcome Richard Painter. <laughs> oh, 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 there you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's an unpleasant surprise. Ooh, right <laughs> be <laughs> between the legs. All right. <laughs> We brought you out to Depeche Mode's Policy of Truth, and there was a purpose for that. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you here with us. First, I believe it was January 2017, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington filed a lawsuit against President Trump to stop him from violating the friggin' emoluments clause of the Constitution. And I was hoping you could give us maybe an update on that case, where it's at, how it's going, and how much he sucks. Oh, <laughs> well. Yeah, we sued him. Uh, pretty much about 24 hours after he was sworn in as president. <laughs> uh, the, the emoluments clause, that's a fancy word. It, it's just, uh, it has a Latin root of monumentum, which means profits and benefits, profits and advantages. And uh, bottom line is that the founders did not think that anyone holding a position of trust in the United States government should be receiving profits and benefits, in other words, bribes, from foreign governments, you know. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Wait, wait, I get it, I get it. Pretty basic, isn't it? I mean, why it's have all that? It's a profit deal. Yeah. yeah, it's a profit deal. I mean, why have all that tea party business and toss all the tea into Boston Harbor and then have a president who's buying his own tea from King George? <laughs> <laughs> or, the, or the czar of Russia or whatever. So, uh, you know, uh, Trump uh, has these hotels and all these businesses where every foreign government uh, that wants to do business with us is, is booking rooms and ballrooms and everything, not to mention the private equity funds and the, you know, the financing the Trump business empire because, uh, of course, no Americans have loaned him any money for the past 25 years. <laughs> it's unconstitutional. Uh, and so we sued him. Uh, in the Southern District of New York, we had ran into, yeah, yeah, we ran into a little problem. It was called a standing problem. That we have standing to sue the president. We're just a government reform organization. <laughs> blah blah blah. And the and the judge in the in the Southern District of New York there said, well, you know, Congress ought to deal with this. Congress isn't a potted plant. I want to bet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we lost that. We took that up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. But meanwhile, we've got two more lawsuits going. On. And one of them, oh yeah, one of them brought by the District of Columbia Attorney General and the Maryland Attorney General in the federal court in Maryland. And that survived the motion to dismiss, has gone on to discovery, and the judge came out with an opinion that said the Monuments Clause means what we said it means. You know, there's a plain meaning as opposed to the Trump meaning, which is it doesn't apply to me. Uh, yeah. So we are going ahead, and we have yet another suit brought by the Democrats in the House and the Senate, led by Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut. That's in the, in the uh, district court in, in D.C. And that one survived the motion to dismiss. Meanwhile, the House of Representatives should also be enforcing the Monuments Clause. Hint, hint. Judiciary <laughs> Committee, impeach him. Impeach him. I'm going to make a sound bite of that. That's awesome. <laughs> and I have a government ethics question for you. Something close to my heart. The Hatch Act. <laughs> so I go by the pseudonym AG to put a little distance between myself and any Hatch Act violations. Though I'm not SES, so I'm only barred from using my title and agency to support or oppose a candidate for political office during working hours. It's not required that I do not use my name, but it's an extra step of caution. I've been just said, that's probably a good idea. But this week, 
Office of Special Counsel determined that Kellyanne Conway has violated the Hatch Act on multiple occasions and recommends she be removed from her job. <laughs> now, the Hatch Act is a law, but Trump has said he will not fire her, and, and that it is his ultimate decision. So what can we do to bolster these ethical norms we used to enjoy and give these rules some kind of enforcement mechanism so that people actually get in trouble when they violate them? Well, that's easy. Trump won't fire Kellyanne, so we just fire Trump, right? I mean, <laughs> that's what we ought to be doing. That's why the House needs to impeach him, and then they can send it up to the Senate. And if uh, Mitch McConnell wants to have a sham trial and let him off the hook, then we just fire Mitch McConnell, too, and the rest of them. Speaking of impeaching, I, I want to ask you about the ethical implications of failing to impeach Trump, putting it off, failing to impeach Trump. I think that, there's, I think that there might be some deep problems with that in the way that uh, the message that we're sending to future presidents, other countries, adversaries, friends, uh, allies, what, what message do we send and what are the ethical implications of not impeaching him, even if the Senate fucks off? We know to impeach him, we're going to look like fools. I mean, look at the Constitution. It says high crimes and misdemeanors. They either committed high crimes and misdemeanors or he did. It's one way or the other. And um, I mean, what are we going to teach the kids in the history books? Well, when is the last time we impeached the president? Well, Bill Clinton, he lied under oath. What did he lie about? Oh, well, we don't need to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> At least till you're in the ninth grade. Uh, <laughs> But, um, Is it? Uh oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then we got a president who's caught literally in bed with Vladimir Putin. I mean, not literally, but you know. Uh, <laughs> and he lies about it, and they're covering it up, so the president can get bed with the Ruskies, and we don't, we don't impeach him. And uh, not to mention the emoluments, and of course the payoffs to Stormy Daniels. Yeah, he's individual one is riding on Air Force One. I mean. This is the most uh, corrupt presidency we've ever had. Well, yeah, and then we have the time when he uh, tried to get the Postmaster General to raise the rates on Bezos, who, as we know, runs the Washington Post. That's abuse of power. I mean, there's a million. The First right? Amendment of the Constitution has no respect for. He's uh, not only, uh, he, he talks about the press the way Hitler talked about the press in the 1930s. I mean, look at the old speeches. He, just got to translate it out of the original German, but it, it isn't that <laughs> different. It, you know, they talk about the lying press and the attacks in the press. It is a very dangerous situation. Dude, you're funnier than I. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> All right, I have, a, I have a question for you. And this is uh, something we didn't even talk about before. You know this subpoena battle that's going on between, not, well, it was Mueller's team, now it's the D.C., and it was D.C. before that, but the secret company from Country A... Do you have any guesses on who that company might be, who that country might be? I have no idea, but we ought to know by now. It's in the redacted portion of the Mueller report. And I'm sure it is, and they redacted everything out of the first, particularly the first part of the Mueller report that has to do with any money, business ties to the Russians. It's all redacted by Attorney General Barr, who never should have been involved in this case because he's working for the defense. He was working with the defense lawyers before he came into the Department of Justice. He should have recused from this case from day one. And so he's redacted all the good stuff out of part one of the Mueller report. And that's all in there. The good stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's like redacting the blowjob part of impeaching. Like, why would... Well, yeah. He's fast forwarding through <laughs> the sex parts of porn and yeah, listening to the know, story. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's all adjectives, but I don't know what they're describing. <laughs> yeah, that... I think that was a high crime misdemeanor we had 20 years ago. But it, was, it was limited to that. I mean, what's going on? We, but here we get that, too. We get golden showers with this guy. the Q&A part of this, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about what we can do to improve ethics enforcement in a post-Trump government? 
First, we've got to get from here to post-Trump government. <laughs> I mean, like now. Yeah, I mean, this is really pathetic. How do we come up with this guy? I, I, I moved to Minnesota in 2007. I'm from central Illinois, but I spent some time when I was young as a lawyer in New York City. And the one thing I learned very quickly in New York City is that nobody would loan any money to Donald Trump. <laughs> and they, they had the $900 million worth of casino bonds on the Taj Mahal that went a belly up. No one would loan him money, and yet somebody started loaning him money in the late 90s. Now, who was it? <laughs> well, well, whatever. And we don't get to find out because he won't show us his tax returns. I mean, this has been, I mean, how do we get conned by this guy? Because all he does is go outside of Manhattan, and he gets about, you know, 100 miles or so, you know, to the west, gets into Pennsylvania, and people start believing this stuff. Uh, and he is a con man, and he is a traitor. He doesn't belong in the White House. Let's get him the heck out of there. I agree with you 100%, Mr. Painter. Did you know that millennials have three times as much student debt as their parents? And a lot of us from all generations are paying really high interest rates on those loans. But right now, you can get your student loans right by refinancing them with SoFi. It's super easy, it only takes about two minutes online, and it doesn't create a hard pull on your credit so it won't affect your score. So in about two minutes, you can see how SoFi can lower your rates and save you thousands over the life of your loan. SoFi is the leading student loan refinancer in the United States, with hundreds of thousands of loans refinanced, and it's extremely user-friendly. I went online and was able to enter a couple of pieces of information, and in less than two minutes, I was shown how fast I could pay off my loans and the lower interest rates. Uh, I could lock those in, and it turns out that with SoFi's lower rates, I could pay my loan off in half the time with the same payment I make now. But SoFi gives you multiple options, too, so you can select the payoff plan that works best for you by either lowering your payment amount or speeding up the time it takes to pay off. You also get exclusive benefits that help you get ahead with your money and your life and your career. So like you get access to awesome member experiences like SoFi sponsored cocktail hours and networking events. You get free tickets to shows and even sporting events. Finally, you'll get exclusive access to complimentary career coaches to help you get your next promotion or advise you on how to ask for a raise. So check your rate in two minutes on SoFi.com slash AG. That's S-O-F-I dot com slash A-G. Lock in a fixed low rate today at SoFi.com slash A-G. Again, that's S-O-F-I dot com slash A-G. SoFi Lending Corp, CFL number 6054612. While we have you here, uh, we would love to bring back a fan favorite segment and take some questions from the audience, if that would be okay with you. Sure. So guys, well, what, you, what we do is we have about time for about 10 questions. If you want to get up, line up in front of one of these microphones. If you have a question for any, anybody up here on the panel, and uh, we'll give you a minute to get up and check that out. While people are lining up, can, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> can, I ask, can I ask Richard a question really quick? Yeah, what's your question It'll for Richard quick. while you're lining up? Yes, okay, so. What role in the future do you think nonprofit organizations like Crew are going to have to play in holding people in Congress accountable? Because Congress should be the people that are holding them accountable, but increasingly so, it's organizations like Crew and that are doing that. Yeah. And journalists. It's going to be a critical role because Congress isn't going to hold anybody accountable. They're not going to diddly squat until we get the money out of politics. It's messing up the Woo! whole Congress. Both, both parties, I mean, the amount of money in politics, the big companies, the multinationals. I've been fighting with these multinational sulfide mining companies that want to get into, into Minnesota and mess up the boundary waters, including Jared and Ivanka's landlord. Yes. Um, oh, we need, a, we need nonprofit organizations, and I'm working with nonprofit organizations on the boundary waters issue right now. Uh, we need that work. 
awesome. Thank you. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, because and I think that, like honestly, most of the shit that's come out has been from FOIA requests from journalists, not from Congress, not from investigators. It's it's come out from journalists and nonprofit organizations. They're, I think they, sh I I agree, they're going to play a huge role. All right, so it looks like we got enough questions. So um, that this should do it. So let's uh, hand it over to you. What's your name? What's your question? Um, is because Nancy oh, because Nancy Pelosi keeps um, waiting to do impeachment. What do you think is going to be what pushes it over the edge? Mm -hmm. I, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> they know what I think. <laughs> First of all, I don't think the speaker ought to be making the call. I think the whole House of Representatives ought to make the call. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know that it, it's very important that each member of the House speak his or her own conscience and not be told what to do by the speaker. And I have urged my congresswoman, Angie Craig, to call for impeachment. I mean, that, that's why she's there, because we have this clown, Jason Lewis, who's running around apologizing for Trump. We sent him packing. Well, I think Angie Craig's got to come out and call for impeachment. So each and every member of the House ought to speak his or her own mind, and the speaker is one of the 435 of them or so. That's my attitude. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Uh, we'll go over here. Hi there. Uh, I'm Vincent. Um, so uh, this is kind of a, uh, maybe it's an absolutely stupid question, but uh, when Mueller was doing his like nine minute spiel, when he finally spoke publicly, he was pretty explicit when he said that they cannot charge the president with a federal crime. But I haven't heard anybody say like, well, what about the states? Can't the states charge him with the crime? He, didn't, he said federal crime very specifically. And I know he chose his words carefully. Everyone says that. Yeah, I mean, he never speaks a word that he doesn't yeah. mean. It's, it's always very deliberate. And I wondered about that, too, because there were that, was that rumor mill going around that Southern District New York was thinking about charging with crimes. And, and so, you, you, know, you, you know these folks. What, do you have any insight on that that, that, that I might be missing? Well, there's an open constitutional question about whether the President of the United States can be charged with any crime before he's removed from office. I think he can be and should be. Um, others might disagree. That would issue would have to be resolved by the courts and ultimately by the United States Supreme Court. We have never, ever had to deal with this because we have generally had pretty honest presidents. Is there a chance that somebody exceptions. might try, though? Yeah, and yes. I'm wondering when and the, the state Southern of District New York, New York could try, and they could go ahead, and they ought to just charge him. And that's the right. answer. Here the here. reason Robert Mueller said this was that Robert Mueller is under the Department of Justice, and the Trump Department of Justice, of course, takes the position that the only right answer to this is that the President of the United States could never be charged with any crime while in office because, of course, he's Donald Trump and he's in charge of, he points the Attorney General. So uh, that is why Robert Mueller said that, that he can't charge Donald Trump with anything because he works for the Department of Justice and the Department of Justice says absolutely no. That's our interpretation of the law. But I invite and encourage the Attorney General of the State of New York to charge him with whatever they can find. They should have done it 20 years ago. We wouldn't be in this mess. Yeah. And I I'm encouraged by uh, Tish James there in New York. But yeah, that, that Office of Legal Counsel memo only covers federal uh, courts and U.S. attorneys' offices. It does not cover, as far as I can tell, or at least there'd be a good argument for it in court, state crimes. So well, he, might be, like, it, he might. Yeah, he's just saying I, this is what they told me. He's basically signaling. The signal's pretty clear. I indict him in a minute if he weren't president of the United States. It's really clear. Just read the second half of the Mueller report. Uh, I mean, this is obstruction of justice written all over it. And I'm old enough to remember the whole Nixon thing. And uh, this is a lot worse than Tricky Dicky. Tricky Dicky. Oh. I mean, Nixon. Nixon was a crook, but he was our crook. He wasn't in with the Russians. <laughs> yeah. Hi. What's your name and what's your question? My name is Lauren, and I actually have two questions, so I'm sorry. Um, I live up in Stearns County. Um, my representative is Tom Emmer, which is- Oh, yes, boy. Thank you. Um, so how does someone like me have representation? Because he doesn't count. Um, <laughs> second, 
I I have anxiety, um, and Woo! That's, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and so I feel like the last few years we have been in a collective anxiety attack, um, very much so. And there's so much fear, and there's so much panic, and it's a really unhealthy way to live. Um, and I'm wondering, how do we come back from this? Where's the, in some sense, the breaking point? When does it, when does it wash over us, um, and how do we come back from it? Oh, oh yeah. Sure. Can I? Can I come back from Tom Emmer? Now that's <laughs> tricky. Um, I ran into him in the airport. I was on my plane, and I think he was up in the first class section, of course. And, uh, but uh, uh, waiting for the plane, he, I asked him about this. He said it's just a witch hunt. Uh, yeah, right, a witch hunt. Um, uh, Tom Emmer uh, has got to go. So the first thing is to find people going to run against him, either in the Republican primary or over in the DFL side, and find someone who's going to fit the district rather than yeah. run some sort of ideological purity test and a yeah. bunch of social issues. I mean, get rid of Tom Emmer. Uh, and uh, because he's just kowtowing to... Uh, uh, you know, to, to Trump. And you can forget, there's some great Republicans in this state. I mean, Arnie Carlson, former governor, I'm working with him on this, uh, this pollution of the Boundary Waters issue. Uh, uh, I don't know if he'd run, but anyway. Uh, we got, you gotta get somebody to get rid of Tom <laughs> Emmer. And uh, we, we got rid of Jason Lewis down in yeah. CD2. Yeah. Oh, he's a piece of work. So then, you know, uh, but we, we do need to you know, have some basic standards in this country for public service and realize that uh, someone like Donald Trump doesn't measure up. And, uh, you know, why would someone just because they're Republican say we're going to put up with this? So if you're a Republican, uh, go out there and vote for Bill Weld for the uh, presidency. He's going to be a good, I hope they get a good campaign uh, going and, and have a primary challenge on the GOP side, and then kick his tail on the, on the, uh, in the general election if he isn't impeached first, which he should be. And real quick, I, I know Sarah Lee, because she actually, you, you have like a, um, an expertise in this anxiety, yeah. as far as the anxiety part of the question. I, so my day job is a mental health social worker. And thank you. <laughs> Not the response you usually get, but okay. <laughs> um, and. And so the clinical treatment for anxiety in the midst of a panic attack is a grounding exercise in which you remind yourself you are safe and you are here and you can do that through visualization. You can feel the ground behind, beneath you. You can do whatever you need to do, your sensory things. So you need to do the same thing politically. You need political grounding. And the best way to do that is to get involved in your local area to learn how to lobby, to learn how to work with legislators and your representatives and find those other people because you're not alone and everybody else feels that same way, but that anxiety is making us isolate yeah. and we need to come together. And, and if, you're, if you're wondering like how we come back from it and how we get through it, like look around, you know, this is, it's this, it's what we're building and what we've built and, and not just us, but all resistors and that we're all here for each other. That I think helps ground us too. So thank you for your question. My name is Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin. Um, we might all have that friend that we were, you know, childhood friends with that kind of get, got onto the wrong course. <laughs> And uh, is now in a relationship we find questionable and uh, wondering what they're up to. And some part of you just wants to step back and let them self-destruct. Well, that is Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> and I, not, I knocked on a lot of doors in District 2 for Angie Craig, and we got that. But in 2020, if... The Democrats pick up Pennsylvania and Michigan and do not pick up Wisconsin. We're looking at a 269-269 electoral split. Mm. In which case, the House of Representatives picks, but not by House of Representatives majority, but by state representation in the House of Representatives majority, which means they would pick a Republican. Even with California? <laughs> yeah. Right, yes. Each state gets a vote, not each representative. Well, then why don't they just fucking take it to the Senate, assholes? 
So it may very well come down to Wisconsin. And as much as we want to step back... <laughs> and in true Wisconsinian style, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So my question is, at what point do we cross the border and have an intervention? What time do we cross? I, I, you asked. I crossed the border. I was like already imagining myself doing well, it. So normally what, we what cross the, the border. Your- normally we cross the border on Sundays in order to buy liquor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was like, what? We figured that out. So. No, I see what you're saying now. Um, ooh, yeah. I think about dual citizenship all the time. Any dual citizenship people in here at all? Yeah, we gotta talk. I gotta figure out how to do that. I'm scared too. Like I, the fact that it comes down to one state, I didn't even think about that because I'm so like thinking about what's happening right now. But like that's a real possibility. That's we insane. Can't, we can't let Wisconsin go so easy. We gotta get in there. You know? Well, they they feel forgotten, right? That's like the, what it is, right? Yeah. So hopefully the next Democratic candidate, you know, whoever wins the primary, like actually addresses them. You know, that would be probably a place to start. But vote, for, yeah. but vote for him no matter who the fuck it is. Yeah, please vote blue no matter who. Oh my god. <laughs> I've got my could, hopes. Could I ask a I've question? I've already pledged. Could I ask a question? What is what in the world has Donald Trump done for Wisconsin? Has <laughs> done anything. So I don't know why in the world anyone's gonna. Hey, they got conned once in Wisconsin. They really want to look stupid. Get conned again. <laughs> But then I mean, we all get conned in the process. <laughs> all right. It's so, just tough. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. It is. And I've already pledged my vote in the primary goes to whoever women of color are backing. Yeah. And then Woo! my... And then my vote uh, in the general just goes to whoever the fuck wins. Definitely, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll worry about the repercussions later, but <laughs> even if no, wait, we're an open primary state, though. Bill Weld, if he's on that ballot, yeah, you want to send Donnie boy a message? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got a question over here. All right, uh, thank we- you very much. And by the way, um, I'm a big fan of Richard Painter. Ah, me too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I have a a question that's more of a legal question. Um, If we were to be lucky enough to see that train go down the road where um, impeachment hearings um, are in full swing, uh, we send it to the the Senate and they cannot uh, convict because of uh, McConnell. What is um, the danger that he will then have a constitutional out for um, a prosecution in a court of law. Oh, like afterwards. a double jeopardy? Does, double does, does an impeachment make yep. you susceptible no. to double jeopardy? No. He's exonerated if he's not indicted in No, in it's a political process. Yeah. It's not a criminal process, so well, it wouldn't... Uh, yeah, we'll let him do. off the hook. I mean, if Bill Clinton had actually committed a crime, he could have been charged. He just he hadn't committed actual perjury. I don't right. want to go through that whole mess okay. again. But, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that being let off the hook in the Senate doesn't let you off the hook on a criminal charge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that if this happens, and I don't know why the people are so worried about it, you send it up there uh, to the Senate, and you're going to have the Chief Justice of the United States show up, and hopefully not wearing those stupid gold stripes this time around that, that we had 20 years ago. And uh, that, you know, first the courts are going to start to have to enforce the subpoenas. It could be very embarrassing if they don't enforce the subpoenas once you have an impeachment trial. And then you'd have a trial. And if Mitch McConnell wants to play games, he's up against some pretty heavy hitters. I mean, Elizabeth Warren, she's been calling for impeachment from day one. And, uh, you know, I think she'd, she'd rip him apart. So bottom line is, you know, they might have the votes, they might not, to let Trump off the hook. It's, uh, but, you know, that's not a reason not to charge him. I mean, just because you're going to have a jury it's like these old cases down in Mississippi. You try and charge a Klansman, and you can't get them. But that doesn't mean you don't charge them. If the all-white jury wants to let them off, okay. But you still got to charge them. The prosecution's job is to charge the crime if they see the crime. And then out, out goes Mitch McConnell. He, he, he's up for re-election, and they're going to send him out to pasture down in Kentucky. Yeah, I mean, if they let him off the hook, we use that to run against him. All right, let's get through these questions, and then I got a fun activity at the end. Yes, sir. Duck, duck, goose. Hello. (laughs) 
Uh, my name is Clay Bradbury. I, I too have two questions, but I promise they're super quick. But first, if I can stand on a soapbox just for three seconds, I do want to offer my gratitude to all you ladies. I've had... <laughs> I've had the distinct pleasure of talking to a lot of other Mother She Wrote fans, and there are a lot of us who feel like we exist in a box. We're in social circles where our friends are not as politically active or paying attention as much as we are. And as heavy as we are being gaslighted by this administration, sometimes it's hard not to go insane in a box. So I'm insanely appreciative. I know I've dealt with some of my anxiety uh, through listening to you guys and through your reverence and your sense of humor. Thank you. All the hearts. Yeah. Right back at you. Absolutely. So the first question I have um, is not so much um, political as it is, I guess, personal. It really deals with mental hygiene. So a lot of us have experienced uh, feelings of powerlessness, feelings of anxiety, feelings of despair in dealing with the active attacks on our democracy, on our values. And arguably, I mean, you guys hit these topics a lot harder than, than we do, and you, you show up every week, and you're funny, and you're irreverent. What are your mental health hygiene tips for when you fall far too down the rabbit hole? Well, that's um, really, realize you're not the one who's got the mental health problem. <laughs> read, read the 25th Amendment of the United States Constitution. That says what we should be doing about somebody like this. And we aren't, and that, that needs to be fixed too because Congress has the authority to set up a commission that would address the, uh, implement the 25th Amendment. You can't have a kook holding on to the nuclear weapons. <laughs> so he's got the mental health problem. We gotta get him out the door. better Yeah, I think um, w my degree in undergrad was political theory and a lot of what that amounted to was essentially pendulums and understanding where we're at on the pendulum right now and knowing that time eventually swings a pendulum back with the presence of the people that exist in that time. So the only way that you're going to keep that pendulum on the trajectory of coming back to where things are better again is to remain in the moment and not dip out and try as hard as you can to stay in it. And it's like, really hard, but meditating helps a lot. I know that's like a super white girl thing to say, but, <laughs> but, but, but it really helps me because I deal with like, my anxiety presents as dissociation a lot and like come everything coming together at one point as much as possible, I think, and, and knowing that what you're doing here and now matters so much. And it's like, you, you get the sense that it doesn't matter, but it 100% matters is what you have to do. Yeah, I mean, look at what we did in 2018, so. What was that? Look what we did in 2018. Oh, yeah, yeah. And honestly, this is a less serious answer, but I play a lot of laser tag. Yeah, no. I, I get all my frustration out on like 12-year-old boys for some reason, and just like military dudes, yeah, yeah. No, it's not their fault, but um, anything that's like good cardio, I think, like, or just, you know what? One of our fans, um, I believe her name was Ellen. She gave us like these dolls. They're called Damn It Donalds, and you just like bang them on something. Yeah, so shout out to Ellen. Um, but yeah, anything that just physically like gets you going, jogging, whatever, um, yeah, that helps me. That's called self-care. Yeah. 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 Hashtag. Both of those are self-care. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to take your second question. Is it a quick one? It's <clears throat> super, super quick. And okay. Just give. Um, I, one thing that has kept me up at night with this administration is thinking about what after. Um, hopefully, this is at, at most an eight-year administration, barring any kind of <laughs> unnatural disaster. Oh, um, no. So <laughs> I'm curious what you think happens after Trumpism. How do we get back? What, uh, we have to write a bunch of fucking ethics laws with teeth, and then... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we need some ethics law. We have force the ones we have, like the Hatch Act, when and the Monuments Clause, and a bunch of other things. Um, yeah, 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 money yeah. out of politics. Get rid of Citizens United and all that. That's a politics mess. We don't fix that. We're going to get taken over by some other country. I mean, the Russians pulled this stunt, but it's going to be China, the Saudis, or somebody because we're up for sale. We got a for sale sign on our government. Oh, yeah. United, so we gotta fix that. 
And then we got to have some ethics laws on conflicts of interest. Elizabeth Warren has a good bill on that. that would, yeah, she would require the president, the vice president, and members of the U.S. House and Senate to not have financial conflicts of interest. We shouldn't have United States senators owning, uh, you know, health care stocks. We shouldn't have a president who's in the real estate business. And uh, Elizabeth Warren's bill would shut that circus down. Thank you, and Sarah, shout out to social workers. We are underappreciated. Big hearts. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Hi, it's Eric from Minneapolis. Um, so I addressed this to Mr. Painter earlier, but I'd like to hear again from Mr. Painter and the MSW crew. Um, I have some very staunch pro-Trump people in my lives, and I love them very dearly, but I'm wondering how do you move them to understanding the crisis that we're in. Mueller um, report by Mueller she wrote. No. <laughs> I understand that, but they would go, they're, they're like, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear that. Yeah. So I, I think com common ground is really helpful. Like, because even I get caught in my like progressive bubble, but there's a lot of common issues that, you know, Americans have. And so, yeah, I, I feel like if, if you start off with like, hey, I know you're feeling this way or however you want to address it and then try to come in with the things to disagree with, like they might hear you more if the first thing you say is something that, you know, is... is Compliment a sandwich. Yeah, yeah, sort of like, yeah, yeah. Or like and the is, money out of politics. I know most Republicans I know want to get money out of politics. They don't want their oh, politicians yeah. bought and sold either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look for common ground. Yeah, definitely money out of politics. Across the board, you have agreement on that. And then even on some of the other issues, I, I find just the language you use to talk about an issue can affect uh, how it comes across. Uh, you know, I, you know, I th don't think the government should be regulating abortions, for example. But I, I you know, I, I address that as a, you know, a freedom issue. It's not men versus women. It's not a group identity thing. No, the government has no business sticking its nose in healthcare decisions and end of life and all that too. Uh, you know, try to reach out and create as big a group instead of this group versus that group. And uh, you know, the polarizing rhetoric that I, I think has some. Obviously, we had most of it from Donald Trump, but you can, you can also come up with polarizing rhetoric and group identity politics on the other side that just gets, that gets things going and it feeds on itself. Uh, let's bring everyone together. We're one country and we certainly don't need the Russians choosing our president. I mean, how many of these people really think the Ruskies ought to be choosing our president? Yes, sir, hello. Regarding the redactions in the Mueller report, uh, Robert Mueller says he seems to be okay with them. I'm just wondering, how valid is it to redact the unindicted people that were listed in the report? Well, uh, Robert Mueller's not okay. I don't think he's okay with this being withheld from Congress. So first of all, the entire unredacted Mueller report needs to go to Congress. And they could review it and their subpoena needs to be complied with, and I'm sick and tired of subpoenas getting greeted with a middle finger from this administration. Yeah. <laughs> so. Could you imagine like an average, like poor American just saying, no, I'm not gonna answer your subpoena? <laughs> it would not happen, yeah, that's insane. Uh, get a bench too. warrant. Yeah. We they need would... a bench warrant for William Barr is what we need. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one day they'll rename it the Bar Warrant, and, yeah. and it'll be named after him once we arrest him. Hi. I'm, like, I'm squeezing just in. This is great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm Kate. I love the podcast. It's fantastic. Can we start a new sort of fantasy league where you could select maybe three to five people that we could actually hear from debate in the Democratic uh, debates coming up? Because yeah. I don't know what 25. John Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would love to hear who would you love to have up on that stage and you know who do you want to hear most from? Out of like the 500 candidates? Yeah, and their mom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean Warren is super, super at the top of my list right now. Um, Kamala is a brilliant person. She's incredibly brilliant. And then... Yeah, I'm trying to... I'm trying to pick my white dude pick. Oh, <laughs> Which, white dude. That, okay, the guy that's... Uh, Buddha, yeah, Buddha Judge is fantastic. Yeah, Buddha Judge is fantastic. Andrew Yang, because he has that whole, like... Yeah. 
$1,000 to every household? Yes. Um, I don't know how far it'll go, but I want to see him debate it. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. Sames. <laughs> I'm all Same about Mayor Again, I've already pledged my vote. Well, who, who's the governor who said he's going to fix climate change if he's president? Like, okay, I like that guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my white guy pick right there. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I don't think he made it to the debate stage. Did he make it to the... Yeah. He, did? he did? All right, yeah. all right, cool. Which day? One or two? Two? Nice. They're both going to be good. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> June 26th and 27th, I think. Yep. Whew. We'll have a drinking game. How are you? <laughs> Are you all going to let Amy Klobuchar know she's going to change her stance on sulfide mining? We do not want that in the Boundary Waters. Mm -hmm. That campaign's not going anywhere if they don't fix that. And the Trump yeah. people, Trump's been out here three times shilling for polymet and for twin metals, and it's a disaster that the Trump people are cooking up, and we need our senators to stand up against that. Mm -hmm. Last question. Deborah, U of M alum. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice to meet you, Richard, dear, and all of you. Um, what drives me fucking nuts is <laughs> uh, uh, the, the OLC memo. Yeah. And it's the one that says you can't indict a sitting president or the one that says Trump doesn't have to hand his taxes uh, over? The, to the latter. Uh, and uh, it's like a catch-22. So if this president or any other president got in illegally and then you can't indict. Yeah, that's the big question, right? What if he sh did shoot someone on Fifth Avenue? You just can't indict a sitting president? Well, what if, what if he did uh, hide uh, people that, um, you know, he paid off, you know, for, you know, like SDNY uh, whores. And, uh, you know, um, he got in, what if he got in illegally? And we still can't do And it's it. a terrible catch-22 with it's, the Attorney General because we can't go make a criminal referral from the Congress to the Department of Justice because uh, Barr is in charge of that. And we yeah. can't, and there's just not that many ways around it. That's why I really like your idea of having the New York Attorney General, Attorneys General around the country yeah. uh, bring charges. Yeah, yeah. So my yeah. point exactly yeah it yeah. seems like they almost planned it right like everything <laughs> no really i think they studied every single law they knew they can get away with they're like get around and yeah it just well here's my real question <laughs> well trump didn't study it but somebody did <laughs> no no my real concern is what do we do about that uh, memo Hopefully not have to write it out. I mean, Rich, that's the worst case. Well, I think there's or, a couple Rich, of presidential candidates who have who've said that they're going to get rid of it. Richard, I don't know how do you get. Do you have OLC. any ideas, Richard, yeah. on besides what we've discussed already? You know, not for now, maybe, but in future. OLC has lost its reputation, and this came before Trump. We have these uh, people at OLC and. John Yu and those guys drafted up those torture memos back in 2003 and to completely just store it in the law. Yeah, you know, basically OLC is part of the Department of Justice and they're supposed to be giving advice interpreting the law and the Constitution, but at the end of the day they get pressure from the White House and they cave. They're all political appointees and the Republican administrations are all these Federalist Society guys running around wearing the Federalist Society ties. They aren't career government employees. And so OLC memos, I mean, there's another one was nepotism. They told me that the president couldn't hire his family. They showed me a memo that said that Jimmy Carter couldn't hire his son as an intern in the White House. Uh, when I was in the White House, I asked that question, and they showed it to me, and I had to tell some big shot he couldn't bring his son as an intern. And uh, then, of course, they turned around on that. We got Jared and Ivanka. So they turned around on a dime, yeah, at OLC. So, uh, you know, I don't advocate graffiti, but I uh, sometimes would like to go into a washroom, sit down there, and look over there and see OLC memo, take one. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. As good as a roll of Charmin. All right, guys. So this is my favorite part of the show. Thank you for your question. Thank you for all your questions. Thanks for coming out. Um, so Manafort's on his way to New York to face state charges there for real estate fraud, I think. And uh, he gets to stay while he's there at Rikers Island. 
It's comfortable. It's neighborhood adjacent. No, it's Rikers fucking Island. So, I'm really excited about this because uh, I get to bring back one of my favorite parts of the show. And I'm gonna split the room into three parts. You guys over here, <laughs> you are fucked. Let me hear it. Fuck. You guys in the middle, fuck, 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 fuck. All right, we're gonna do it. You ready, everybody? He's going to Rikers Island. Manafort is fuck. Thank you to Richard Painter. Please take care of yourselves, take care of each other. I've been AG. I've been Jaleesa Johnson. I've been Jordan Coburn. And this is Muller She Wrote. Muller She Wrote is produced and engineered by AG with editing and logo design by Jaleesa Johnson. Our marketing consultant and social media manager is Sarah Lee Steiner, and our subscriber and communications director is Jordan Coburn. Fact-checking and research by AG, and research assistance by Jaleesa Johnson and Jordan Coburn. Our merchandising managers are Sarah Lee Steiner and Sarah Hirschberger Valencia. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios, and our website is MullerSheWrote.com. 